users each with a set of needs that probably overlap and you also have an organization that has needs you know the, and I'm saying organization but whoever's sponsoring the website whoever is having you create the website so you got to consider their goals first and foremost whatever you do it should serve those goals so the, the next to last phase of the design was a skeleton or a wireframe and that's where we sketch out in very broad terms what our pages are going to look like and, and we talked about um, depending on the size of the site um, and, and the nature of the pages you may have one wireframe you may have one layout for all your pages or you might have a couple maybe one layout for your home page one layout for um, the rest of the pages or whatever you're not going to have one layout one different layout for every page every page is not going to be laid out differently it shouldn't be all right but you might have a couple of different layouts as long as they're sort of consistent so wireframes look like this this would be a classic sort of wireframe that you would see on a site where you have a header and that should identify very clearly the site and give a sense of what the purpose of the site is so at a glance people should know what the site is alright you have a navigation which are the various links of the site you have a footer which may have a few additional links and maybe some additional information like copyright information and then finally you have the content area so for this particular example we're going to assume that you simply have one layout for all your pages alright we're going to keep it simple and we're going to do uh, a restaurant um, website alright just you know to continue the the example we were doing before so let's talk about the process we're going to go through to convert this from a wireframe to a prototype and then a prototype to the finished website so we're going to do this sort of for each wireframe and since we only have one our job is pretty easy right so we take our wireframe which is just a sketch and we build HTML and CSS template alright so what we're going to do is we're going to create a blank page that has a blank content area that we're going to fill in and duplicate for each page so for example our restaurant might have a home page, a menu page, a contact us page, and a catering page, let's say. All right, might be, might be other pages, but we'll say for now that that, that, that is sufficient. I'm going to create a template that's going to have the code that's going to be common on every single of these pages all four of these pages and what's going to be common this is going to be common this is going to be common and this is going to be common all right I probably want my co my header to be common on every single page all right Mike's Pizzeria I want it to say that on every single page. I want it to look the same. If I have a logo, I want the logo to appear there. Maybe I put my address and phone number and hours on there. All right? So I want that header to be the same on every single page. The navigation, of course, is going to be the same on every page. All right? Even, yeah, I'm going to even have a link to the current page that I'm on. A lot of people think with the navigation, if I'm on the menu page, I shouldn't have a link for the menu page. Or I like to have all the pages always there. That sort of gives you a level of consistency and helps um, do that. The footer, I want to be consistent. I want it to be the same on every page. What's going to be different on this page, on each page rather, it's going to be this content. On the home page, there's going to be something that talks about 
the restaurant, all right? Um, you know, and, and just sort of, you know, uh, general information about the restaurant to catch your eye and maybe give you an idea of what the restaurant is like. The menu page, of course, is going to have the menu in this area. The contact us is going to have contact information, and the catering page is going to have information about catering. All right? So, when I build my template, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to get, make sure my HTML contains the common content. That is, the stuff that's going to appear on every page, I want to be in my template. All right? And then, I want to have the CSS in its own file to give me the layout and look that I want. Once I build a template, I'm going to make some prototype pages. And what's a prototype? Another word for prototype is a model. In other words, I'm going to make pages that look like they're going to look in the final product, but may not have like the exact menu. May only have a portion of the menu, for example. Or maybe doesn't have everything that you were going to put on the contact us, but just has, you know, a phone number and an email address. Or um, maybe um, on the uh, catering page, it doesn't have all the catering that we do. It just has a sample of some of the things that we do. Maybe, for example, on the catering page, we are planning eventually on putting images. Well, maybe it doesn't have images, or maybe it doesn't have the actual images. Maybe it just sort of has placeholder uh, images. All right. So we make a prototype as a model. And the idea is, is we then want to get feedback from it. And we want to get feedback from the people we're building the site for, maybe other members of the team, and so on. Once we are happy with the prototype, we then go and make the final site. Now, the one thing I don't think I mentioned here is when you take the template and making, make the prototype, essentially you're cloning that template. You're making a copy of that template and then changing it. So I take that general template that I designed and I'll make a copy of it and that'll be the menu page. And I'll make a copy of it and that'll be the home page. And then I go in and put the specific content. Now, it's important that we do as good a job as possible of getting the common content down in our template. Because once we start cloning that template, then we have multiple copies of the same HTML code which means that if we have to change the HTML code, if we forgot our phone number in the header, for example, then we'd have to go in and all of the pages that we cloned and put the phone number in. CSS, we want to get down as well. However, we're less concerned about that because that's all going to be in one file. If we choose a color for it and we want a lighter or darker color, we don't have to go into every page. We just go into the single CSS file. Now, when you learn server-side scripting, you'll learn techniques to uh, make it easier to change common content on the page. Again, depending on the particular server-side scripting language you use, there's different techniques to do that. But for now, just coding plain old static HTML pages, all right, um, any common code that you put is going to appear in every individual page, which means if you choose to change it, if, you're, if you need to change it, you're going to have to change it in all those places. So you're going to want to do your best to make sure that this common content is completely done on there. All right. Then you clone and make a few pages for a prototype, get feedback, and with that feedback, make the final site. All right. So that's the general strategy that we're going to use in doing this. Now, again, it all starts with the wireframe. And you notice that each one of these sections of the wireframe is represented by a block, right? Block tags. Block tags stack on top of each other. Another word that we could use is a box. Each one of these is a little box that contains some content. So the first thing that we're going to cover is what is called the CSS box model. Okay? 
The CSS box model contains everything that you want to know. Well, maybe that's an overstatement. But it contains many of the key things that you can do with a block tag or a box in HTML and CSS. So let's go and build our template. All right, I'm going to build the template in, in HTML, and then I'm going to style it via CSS. So let's go into the computer. And I'm going to create, note, uh, create a document in Notepad. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create sections of the code that correspond to each of these sections in my wireframe. I'm just going to put the HTML in. All right. At some point, we're going to make sure that that's the real HTML that we want, that we don't want any changes. But for now, I'm going to put the HTML in, and, and we'll go from there. So what tag do you think will correspond to this? I would say I'll give you a hint. It is written on the paper. This is a header tag. What is this? The nav. I made this too easy. All right. This could be a couple of things. We could make it a section. We could make it an article. All right. And this would be a footer. All right. I'm going to have to try harder next time. I'll have to use synonyms instead of the actual tags for that. I didn't realize I did that until I looked at it. So anyhow, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create my HTML document, my start of a template. So there's my doc type, my declaration, which tells the browser what kind of document it is. That tells the browser that this is an HTML5 document. Here's the head section. Not to be confused with the header section. We do want to say it's in English. We have our body tag. Notice as soon as I put the one tag, I put the other tag. That way I don't have to worry about going back later and doing it. And now we have the four sections. So we have header, nav, I'll make this a section, and then finally the footer. All right, the header put an H1, it says Zeller's Pizza House. My goal this semester is to have a pizza example in every one of my classes. And I think this is the third class that I've had it in. I just need to do Maybe I, I just need two more to go. All right, my online class and my other class. Navigation. Navigation is typically an unordered list, right? Because that's what a navigation is. It's a list of items. And it's unordered because there's not really a natural order. It's like whatever order we think is best. So it's a little bit arbitrary. And it's a collection of links. So I'm going to create my four pages here, index.html. Home. Well, 
know that? I, I, I'm just teasing. No, I did not. So I know what pages I'm going to have. I'm going to have an index. I'm going to have a menu page. I'm going to have a catering page and a contact page. Now I'm assuming that I've gone through the design process and these are the four pages that are, are needed. All right. I'm going to leave that. Well, I'm going to I'm going to go in and I'll put the footer in and I'll just say copyright So I have section in every I I have some content in every section except the middle section, the section itself, the actual section tag. And the reason I do that is because, remember that this is my template. This is where the specific content for each page is going to appear. So on the home page, there's going to be home page information. On the menu page, there's going to be the menus. On the contact us, there's going to be the contact information. And finally, on the catering page, there'll be information about our catering. So that, that's the section. This is the one section that's going to be different on each page. The rest of these sections I want to be the same on each page, right? Because they use the same wireframe. And we automatically achieve that consistency if it's the same. All right, so we go and look at this. And I'm going to call it template.html. And it, of course, looks nothing like, where did I save it at? Oh, in documents. It, of course, looks nothing like my wireframe because I haven't put any styling in there. So there it shows me that. I'm going to go in and turn on file extensions. So I see that is template.html. I view it in the browser. And we're sort of at that first week of class level. Actually, we're worse than that, right? Something ain't right. There we go. Maybe Chrome was just thinking about it. Yeah, there we go. All right. Now, again, it's nowhere like we want to have uh, on our final version, but keep in mind that, um, that um, we haven't done any styling yet. Now, I want a little bit of content on this page, even a template, because I want to see what it looks like. All right, no page is going to have nothing between the nav and the footer. So therefore, I'm going to use what's called Greek text. And it's not really Greek, all right, it's, it's kind of fake Latin, uh, but it's often used by designers as sort of a placeholder text. Now, please do not turn in a design or a finished example that uses Greek text. Greek text in your template is okay. But not in, even, even in the prototype, I would say, you want to see actual content, a sample of the actual content. But I can go in and generate Greek text. They use this in the printing industry since 1500s. 
and I can generate a paragraph of it. And I can copy it. And I can put it in my section. So at least I have an idea of what this page is going to look like with a little bit of content in it. So now I go and save it and review it. I save it to the desktop and review it. And there we are with some sample content. Now, notice a couple things. First of all, the browsers are smart. I go and I start resizing this, and it automatically changes how that is laid out. It fills in 100% going all the way across, and as I make it narrower, it makes it taller. Remember, as always, the way your page looks depends on the defaults of the browser and how the browser just naturally behaves, and it also depends on the CSS code that you put into it. All right. So we don't want to fight against the browser. Some of the things a browser does is neat and good. So let's take advantage of that when we write our CSS. All right, so next thing we're going to do is we're going to put our CSS file in there. So I'm going to go in here and create my link to the CSS file. I also forgot a title. This will be another thing. That will be different on each page, or probably should be different on each page. Type equals text CSS, rel equals style sheet. href equals style.css. Now, I'm going to go in, I'm going to make sure that, go save this guy, and I'm going to go and create the style sheet, put it in the same folder, and I'm just going to make sure that the style sheet and the page link up. So I'm not going to be worried about pretty colors at first. I'm just going to go in and say something like body background what color is that going to be? Red plus green, right? Red, green. You add those together, you actually get yellow. So I'm going to go save it on the desktop, and I'm going to call it style.css. And we get kind of a hideous looking yellow. Let's lighten it up a little bit. Let's make it. All right, that's a little nicer. I'm not sure I want it for my pizza place, but at least I've shown that the, the HTML page is connected to the CSS page correctly. All right. Okay, now I'm going to actually go and styling it. And again, it's important in my mind to do things in little steps. All right, we've created the CSS, we've created the HTML, and we've hooked them together, and we've shown that they're hooked together. 
All right, so now we can move on. And I'm going to go and I'm going to put um, the kind of font that I want on the page. All right, so let's go to W3 schools. Under fonts, it talks about the different kinds of fonts. Sans serif fonts are without these little thingies on the end of the letters. Serif fonts have those little thingies. Serif fonts are considered more sort of classic looking, whereas sans serif are considered maybe a little more sleek and modern. Sans serif is also very, is often very good at reading if you're talking about smaller print on a computer screen. Whereas some, many sites will use sans serif for like the text of an article and serif for the headline of it. Now, to find a font family, you give several fonts because you actually don't know what the user has installed on their computer. So, I'm going to go in and I'm going to say for the body of this page, I want Arial Helvetica Sans Serif. Now, how does this work? If the machine that you're on has the first font, that's the one it uses. If it doesn't have the second font, it, uh, I'm sorry, if it doesn't have the first font, it looks to the second font. The last font on the list is typically always either just the word serif or sans serif. That means use the browser's generic serif or sans serif font, whatever that happens to be. Now you don't know, depending on the kind of software you have and the operating system and the platform, what fonts you have available. So you give a list of them. This, for example, Helvetica, and I'll put it at the top because it's a, it's a more famous font than Arial. Arial is sort of a cheap copy of Helvetica, all right, because Microsoft didn't want to pay to use Helvetica, pay the owners of that copyright. So they made a, 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 a font that looks almost exactly like it. All right. Um, but it will first see if Helvetica is installed. If not, then it will look for Arial. If not, it will look for Sans Serif. Do font names proper have to be in quotes? No. Oh. You put them in quotes if they have spaces in them. So now it goes and looks like this. And again, we could go in and we could make. Um, we could make um, the heading and the header um, serif because, again, headings sometimes look good in serif. So how do we do that? How do we make all the text and the heading in serif? I'm sorry, yeah, in, in a serif font. Well, we would go and say header h1. Font family that we do put in quotes because there are spaces in the font name. And there the header has a different font than the rest of the stuff does. And that particular arrangement is pretty typical to have the headers in serif and the body in sans serif. All right, now we're going to start styling just the header section. That's the first box that we're going to look at. All right, 
What does this mean, by the way? Header H1, it means all the H1s in the header section gets this rule. So that's another selector. Remember, what's a selector? A selector is where we define what on the page gets that particular style rule. And when you have two HTML tags like that, header H1, that means H1's inside the header. All right, so H1's elsewhere on the page won't get that style rule. Only the H1's in the header. So let's do some things with the box. And what I'm going to do, at least for now, is I'm going to put a background of white on the header. I'm not sold on these colors, all right? We probably will change them. But keep in mind that the colors I'm picking now, I want to make sure that they stand out so I can see exactly what's going on on the page. So I'm going to make the header's background color white so I can see exactly where the header is. So I go and save this. And the header goes all the way from side to side except for a little area there. All right. And the text is right up against the edge of it. How wide is the header? The header is the width of the whole screen except for a tiny little bit of margin. How tall is the header? It's as tall as it needs to be. So if I go in and add some code here, I'm like thinking about like what should the hours be? Like I'm really opening up this pizza place. But so I've made that, I've put more content in the header. So now the header is going to be taller. All right. So how did it know to make it taller? Well, there was more content in it, so it made it taller. So that's the browser's default behavior. Now, we can change that here if we want. I can, first thing I can do is I can put a width on it. So I could say width 700 pixels. All right, a pixel is one dot on the screen. Most monitors, well, this monitor is approximately 1,000. Most newer monitors are a little bigger than that. But so 700 pixels would be about like 70% of the screen. And when I do that then, I see the header section doesn't go all the way to the end. Why? Because we have said how wide it's to be. All right. Remember, the browser has defaults for all these things. They, those browser defaults is how something looks, unless we specify otherwise. All right. So, first thing in the box model is we can assign a width. Now, we can assign a width to a specific number of pixels, or we can assign a width a percentage. Oh, not 700%. No, we do not want that. 70%. It looks about the same because, again, the, 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 the screen is about 1,000 pixels. But notice as I make it smaller, that header size gets smaller and smaller. And, again, it does it as long as it can.
One other thing we can do is we can assign a minimum width. So we could say, make it 70% of the page, but don't make it any smaller than 400 pixels wide. So there it's 70%, 70%, 70%. At that point, it's 400 pixels. Notice it doesn't get any smaller because we specified a minimum width. How big is the height? Well, we didn't specify height. So what does that mean? It means it gets the browser's default. And what's the browser's default for height? It's as high as, you, as it needs to be. So if I put a height in here, then that will overrule the browser's default. And if we don't, it will make it exactly fit. Now, one thing that we can see here is that the text goes right to the edge of the header area. The Z starts right here. All right. That doesn't look particularly good and we can change that by putting in what's called padding. So I'm going to say padding 10 pixels. And I'm going to go back to 600 pixels. Our first example, we're going to make everything a fixed size. All right? That's probably the simplest way to do it, but it's certainly not the best. Percentages are typically better, but to keep the first example simple, we'll, we will make it an absolute size of 600 pixels. So I go and save it. All right? Notice what happened. There's extra space from the edge to where the text is. All right. So before the text was right up against it, now we put 10 pixels between there and there. Makes it a little neater, easier to read, more visually appealing. Now, padding actually exists in four directions, right? So if I have a word, or I have words in the header, let's just look at this one word. There's padding to the left, there's padding to the right, there's padding from the top, and there's padding from the bottom. You can specify those four directions a couple different ways. One way is if I say padding 10 pixels, that will put padding in all four directions 10 pixels. So it's sort of a shorthand. Second way I can do it is I can specify the individual thing. So I can say padding left 10 pixels. And what that will do is only pad it from the left side. So the padding's on the left, but there really is no padding on the top and bottom. Let's make it a little more dramatic. So I said padding left 20 pixels, and now there's 20 pixels there. But there's no real additional padding on the top, bottom, R or really on the right. It looks like there is, on, it looks like there, are, there is space on the right, but that's not from the padding. Now there's a third way I can specify, and that is by giving two, three, or four numbers as part of the padding. 
So if I say padding 10 pixels, that makes it 10 pixels going around. If I say padding 10 pixel, 50 pixel, what that will do is that will set the top to 10 pixel, the right to 50 pixel, the bottom to 10 pixel, and the left to 50 pixel. So it like goes in a circle clockwise starting at the top. So that's a shorthand. You'll see it done both ways. And it doesn't really matter to me which way you do it. You know, just make sure you understand both ways because sometimes if you see an example online it will show it one way versus the other. So let me do that. Let me say padding 10 pixel, 50 pixel. So I'll save that. 10 pixels at the top, 50, 10, 50. All right, so that's padding. Sec uh, we've done padding and width, and we've done height, but we're letting the browser have control of the height because the browser knows what it's doing as well. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to put a border around it. All right, and a border is also one of those properties where there can be several values. So a border has a border style, a border has a width, and a border has a color. So I could say border style solid border width three pixels border color black and that's what we get. I can also do it in shorthand where I simply say border and I say solid three pixels black. Let me make it wider so we can really see the difference. All right, so there's a thicker border. Now how does that work? Well, there's only one thing about a border that can be solid, and that, it's, that is the style of the border. So the width isn't solid, the color can't be solid. The browser automatically knows if I say border solid, I mean the border style. Likewise, the only thing that could be five pixels is the border width. So it goes and puts that in there. Likewise with border color. So that's a shorthand way of referring to it. Now in CSS3, there's a cool thing where you can put a radius. That is, you can have rounded corners. So I could say border radius 10 pixels. And there we get a little bit of a rounded corner on that. The higher number, the more bend it gets. Now I'm going to try something, and I don't know how it's going to work. So I don't have my explanation ready yet. So we'll have to, we'll have to, we'll have to see how it actually looks, and then, we can, then I'll explain to you why it works that way. I've been using Google Chrome specifically. Let's go and open this in Internet Explorer. Hmm. Not, it's not getting my CSS for the header. All right. Why isn't it getting the CSS for the header? Okay. Can you elaborate? <laughs> All 
Okay. Uh, I, I think I think you're you're definitely on the right track. Let me let me phrase it a little bit differently. Earlier versions of Internet Explorer don't get HTML5. All right. And therefore, because I use the HTML5 elements like header and footer and section, it doesn't know what to do with it. Notice what part of the style did work, the background color of the body. So it's not that the style didn't work at all, it's that the style for the header section didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, it doesn't understand HTML5, it doesn't know what a header is. So there's a fix that we can put into our page that will accommodate that. And it's talked about in the book and I'll talk about it next time. All right. The one last thing I want to cover is I want to cover the margin. And the margin is the space between things. So if I have a box and then there's another box here, I can specify a margin to say how far from the edge of the screen and from the next element. So we have margin, border, padding, and width. So in other words, how wide something is depends on all those things. All right. This, for example, if we view it in Chrome, from here to here is, well, let's see, 600 plus there's 50 on each side. So that's 700, plus there is 10 on each side. That's 770, if my Monday morning math is good. So from here to here is 770, because you've got to take the, to figure out the total width that something takes up, you've got to take the width of the border, plus the width of the padding, plus the width. So when I specify width, I'm talking about the width of this content here. Not the total width. The total width you have to add the padding and border on. Now the margin then I can specify and what is you can often do with margin is you can say margin do it the same way as with padding, top, right, left, and bottom. So I can say margin 20px auto. And what auto will do is it will automatically center it. So it will automatically create the margin for the left and the right, and it will set 20 pixels on the top and bottom. So if I do this, it's centered. There's 20 pixels between the top and the bottom. And as I move it, resize it, it recenters it. So, that's the basics of the box model. Height, width, padding, margin, and border. All right. What we'll do next time is we'll continue on this path. First thing that we're going to do is we're going to fix Internet Explorer. At least partly fix Internet Explorer. We're also going to fix earlier versions of Firefox. Now, we didn't have this problem in, in Firefox if we were to open this up. That works in Firefox too, but what I want to point out is it's not just Internet Explorer. The way that these things evolve, new features don't get integrated in the browser quickly enough, and therefore because we happen to have an old version of Internet Explorer, um, we see the problem. So what we'll do next time is we'll look at, first of all, how we can fix Internet Explorer to look like the other ones. All right, which is our goal, right? We want our page to look consistent across platforms. We can't always achieve that goal, but we want to take as good a shot as we can with it. 
and then we'll continue and style the rest of this template and then uh, maybe make it look nice and appropriate for a pizza place and then once we're happy with the template we can start cloning it and uh, at creating our actual pages for the home page, the menu, and so on. Any questions here? Yes? I at home have a internet with Windows 8. Okay. And I noticed uh, with an earlier assignment that the main tag working on Chrome Firefox, but the game was nowhere to be recognized. Right. Uh, and again, I, I don't have the uh, versions memorized off the top of my head but um, certain versions of Internet Explorer. This actually raises a good point. There's actually a chart. Um, if you Google HTML5 support, can I use? This shows you a nice chart. And I can look at, for example, these are called what? New semantic elements. IE version 8 doesn't support these. IE version 9 and afterwards do support them. So the green means that it mostly supports them, and the red means it doesn't support them at all, and the olive means it sort of does, sort of doesn't. So if you want to take a look at a certain feature, the canvas tag in HTML5 is used for animation. And again, to your point earlier, we're typically going to see IE behind the curve of that. The, the later version or the earlier versions of IE don't support a lot of these HTML5 things. If we pick some features, then other browsers don't support them as well. That would be another good thing to try. All right. Here's a new feature that almost no one implements. So I wouldn't spend too much time trying to use that. It's in the specification. You could do it, but it's not going to work on anything but Firefox. So therefore, you probably avoid that. All right. Okay. We'll pick up on this next time. We'll see you up in lab.